having a valid barcode on Amazon and Walmart is a requirement. Who better to tell us the ins and outs of this than a vice president from the GS1 company itself? How cool is that? Pretty cool, I think. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Serious Sellers Podcast by Helium 10. I am your host, Bradley Sutton, and this is the show that's a completely BS-free, unscripted, and unrehearsed organic conversation about serious strategies for serious sellers of any level in the e-commerce world. And we've got somebody here from a uh, three-letter-slash-number company that is one of the most known, I would say, to e-commerce sellers, GS1. We've got uh, Michelle here. Michelle, how's it going? It's going. I'm doing great. It's going. I love it. And what's your <laughs> position there um, uh, at uh, GS1? So um, my title is VP of Commercialization. I hold a couple of different roles. One, I am... Um, work with um, a lot of our industry members on bringing some new guidelines or new standards to um, market. So bringing new products and commercializing them to, to the um, industry. I also work a lot with some of our large marketplace platforms and helping sellers navigate how to get listed onto some of those marketplaces. Awesome, awesome. How, how long have you been there uh, at GS1? I've, I've been at GS1 for nine years. How long has GS1 been in existence about? Um, GS1 as a standards organization started around 50 years ago. That was the birth of the barcode, um, which is that UPC barcode you see on a lot of your products scanned at a retail store that go beep at the checkout stand. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that barcode was um, created about 50 years ago. So we've been a, wow. a, a helping do business um, for 50 years. Wow. Um, how, did, how did you get in, in this industry yourself? Um, I used to work for a solution partner where we um, helped brands create their UPCs and all the master product data um, associated to it and share with their retail tra um, trading partners. So I started doing that about 20 years ago. And um, because I was so versed in a lot of the standards. When, you, when you were eight years old. Yes, exactly. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> um, and so I helped with, um, you know, those sellers and brands uh, with creating their master data and sharing their retail trading partners. And I was pretty vocal on some of the GS1 working groups um, about product information. And uh, here I am. Okay. Now let's, let's just, you know, uh, I want this to be kind of like a, you know, bunch of the most common questions that people have about this. And, and like I said, this is a, people are not strangers to GS1 or barcodes or things like that. Cause this is something that's actually required, you know, by all Amazon uh, sellers. Now let's just talk about some of these three letter things. Or some of these are not just three letters, but these acronyms. You know, um, can you talk about the definitions and differences of, let's go, uh, G10, uh, GTIN, uh, and uh, UPC, and EAN. Those are the three that that come uh, off the top of my head that that have to do with with what you guys do there. Right. So. This is these are good questions because we do deal with a lot of alphabet soup um, at GS1, um, and so uh, the best way to most people also use them all interchangeably, which we even do within um, our own GS1 walls. But there are there are differences between each of those acronyms. I'm going to lump in barcode too because sometimes barcode is also used interchangeably between them. But let me start at the first um, at the top. GTIN that stands for a Global Trade Item Number, and really that is the um, the name of the the string of numbers that are associated to a product. So think of it as the license plate for the product or that license uh, that that product's unique identifier. Um, that GTIN. Um, is the numbers. Um, there are multiple types of GTINs or formats of GTINs. So there are um, 12 digit, 12 digit GTINs, so 12 um, numbers. Um, those are usually um, embedded into a UPC barcode, which are traditionally used in the US market. A 13 digit GTIN is usually embedded into an EAN barcode, which is used in the European market and other areas um, around the world. So sometimes that UPC and EAN are used um, synonymously with G10, but it is really a UPC barcode or an EAN barcode. Um, and those are the, um, the actual data carriers that carry that number, that G10 um, on the product so that they could be scannable by a machine. You, you know, uh, what, one thing that people have noticed uh, sometimes with Amazon is maybe they didn't get uh, one of these, you know, whether it's GTIN or whether it's, you know, UPC, whether it's EAN, 
directly from GS1, but they, they, they claim it's, it's, they bought it from a place that says, Hey, these are real GS1 things, but I got, got it from barcodes are us or speedy barcodes are, you know, one of these, you know, random ones, but they run into issues on Amazon. So do you, wh why, why are there issues when, when it's a genuine direct from you, uh, you know, barcode, uh, as opposed to if it's gotten from like a third party, uh, site. So, um, GS1 member organizations. So there's also GS1 US, there's GS1 UK, GS1 mm -hmm. Germany, different member organizations around the world. GS1 member organizations are the only um, organizations that license those GTINs. Um, there are claims that other or other companies do claim that they are licensing you um, a GS1 um, identifier, um, but we don't have any um, relationships with anything outside of a GS1 member organization. So if you do go to a third party that claims that you're, they're giving you a GS1 barcode, I just be cautious um, because we don't really have um, relationships outside of that. Um, a lot of platforms like Amazon will say they check the authenticity of your GS1 barcode against the GS1 database. So what they're doing is they're actually looking, um, getting a feed from our um, our database, which is uh, another acronym. I'll call it GAPIR. I've heard other people call it different names, but I call mm -hmm. it GAPIR. Um, it's G-E-P-I-R. It's on our um, both on our global site and on the GS1 US website. But that's the database of all the company prefix license. And we um, record the true licensee of that prefix. So. Um, Amazon and other um, large retailers or marketplaces do actually check um, against that database when a seller is uh, listing their product to make sure that their G10 is registered to their company. Okay. Um, you get a barcode from a third party. Uh, generally, that information will not match because the third okay. party does not have access to update our Gapier license. Makes sense. Makes sense. So now, um, you know, me personally... I get all of my, you know, because I sell on Amazon too. Uh, mm -hmm. I get all of mine from from GS1 UK, and I believe I do like a. I think I think I'm doing like an annual thing, and then I get up to two thousand or something. You know, I probably only use like you know, I'm only selling like fifty or sixty products, so I've, I that's how much I probably use, and I, I guess go to the next number, etc. What are the different options as far as buying it? You know, because some you know what what I'm paying since I since I have 50, 60, 70 products. Uh, that might not be many for uh, some, but then some is like, man, I'm only gonna, ever going to sell one or two. Like, why would I need to buy an annual subscription and get 2,000 you know, uh, barcodes? So what are some different options that people have when they are purchasing from GS1? So um, each GS1 member organization has a different business model. So I'm going to speak towards the GS1 US business sure. model. Um, at GS1 US, um, members could come to us and we have a, a wide variety of options for, to service those very small sellers like that only have one or two products, even to the very large brands who have hundreds of thousands. So um, we have our capacity based, which is tr our traditional offering, which is capacity based prefixes. Um, those start at 10 capacity, 100, 1,000, 10,000 or 100,000. Um, those are prefixes where um, brands could come in and assign their GTINs in those capacity bulk. Um, and there is a license fee and then there's an annual renewal fee for those. But we also heard that a lot of the smaller sellers who have only a handful of products and don't want to um, do the prefix with the annual license fees um, just want one or two. We rolled out a single G10 offering to help service that those particular sellers. Um, we, we rolled that out at the end of uh, 2020, and it allows sellers to come to us, just get a single G10. Uh, it's a one-time fee, $30, no annual renew fees, and hmm. they get to keep that G10 for, for the rest of their life. Okay. Uh, a question on that, you know, like you talk about the prefix, you know, so, so like me personally, all of mine kind of like start, you know, uh, with, with the same, with the same numbers. Um, and then, so it's easy to, to, to see that it's uh, definitely my, my company, mm -hmm. but, um, let's say somebody does a one-off, but now, now they do another one-off, but it's like, you know, a year later. And so it has a different prefix, but because both of them have their, that same company registered, it's not going to throw up any red flags or anything like that. Correct. For our single GTINs, we do still uh, um, issue a certificate of membership and um, recorded in that Gapier database. So, mm -hmm. um, but we do assign them randomly because we don't want anybody out there figuring out our logic. Yeah. Um, so we do assign them randomly. And so they may be assigned from a different um, sets of, of prefixes um, through our system. 
um, but it is still associated to their company. And so if um, a seller comes to us and gets two different G10s at two different times, uh, that, you know, like you said, that first initial prefix may not be the, be the same, but they still will be um, associated um, on that single G10. So Okay. Yeah. Now, what about on the flip side? Like, like, like me, I have maybe multiple companies or multiple brands, but I have one GS1 account. You know, some of the companies might not match, but it, when they're looking at the company match, is it matching it to the account owner of the GS1 account or the individual GS1, whatever we had put as the brand um, there? So brands are always pr- tricky. So it does uh, these when we record the uh, information in our Gapier database, it's your company name. So uh, I could be Michelle's company LLC, but I might have three different brands. Um, those different brands are associated like my I might have a shoe line and a hat line and a water bottle line. So I might have three different brands. Those brands are something that I would manage. We don't report those brands um, um, within our Gapier database. We only report the company name, the, the company licensing it. Um, I think for some companies uh, like Amazon, they have like the brand registry that helps associate your company with your multiple brands. Um, but we don't really record that brand or report the brands associated to a company. Okay. All right. I, I, I haven't I wish run into any issues with that. But uh, Yeah, I think a lot of people would like us to. A nice web to, to kind of navigate um, because of that. A lot of companies do have multiple brands under their company prefix. Okay. Now, you know, when you were talking about the, the, the G10s and, and UPCs, you know, there's, there's, you know, you mentioned how there's different digits and, and there's 14 and then there's 12 and then there's 13 for UPC and stuff like that. Like, why? <laughs> why, why is there these differences and, and, and how can you navigate uh, what you need for, for like Amazon? So um, generally, so if a, a member, we always say members, if a member or a customer comes to GS1 US, um, and get, goes onto our website to um, license their identifier, they will automatically get the G1012, um, the 12 digit G10. Uh, it is just the, the way that we're set up and we license those 12 digits. Every other MO um, licenses the 13 digit. If somebody really needs a 13 digit, they could call into our support. We do have offerings for that, but um, it's just the way that uh, we were set up through our global office and the prefixes we, we render. Uh, the UPC is traditionally used in the U.S. market, um, again, whereas EANs um, in other markets. They are globally unique um, identifiers and they're globally recognized. So it really doesn't matter. Um, mm-hmm. Technically, um, most retail systems can accept both the 13 and 12 digit um, identifiers. So um, that is should not be an issue with your retail partners. Um, the 14 digit is intended for um, um, upper um, like case level packaging hierarchies. So if you um, sell ah, ah, yeah, yeah. your product, um, then that's where the 14 digit G10 comes into play. So like if you go to list on Amazon, I know one of the first questions it asks is what's your product identifier and is it a G10, a UPC or an EAN? The, the expected digits uh, at the G10 on that screen is the 14 digit like case level and then that EAN is usually the 13 digit. Amazon uses the the the, the terminology a little differently than the standards um, do um, on their platform, if that makes sense. Okay. Now, if I'm not mistaken, an actual like UPC barcode that you print and, and that's standard for product packaging and things, regardless of which identifier you have, isn't it a set number of numbers so that I have to like, in some situations add a digit or a check digit or whatever it's called or or like oh is it just the the is it just the the 12 um for the uh what, what do you say for the 12 for the for for the upc or or the isn't it ean 11 or uh, oh it's thir- it's 13 but but then like I, i'm not just printing that 13 on on one sticker and that's okay and then 11 on the other doesn't it have to be a certain number of numbers for a regular upc barcode or how does that work so um you should not be adding any numbers technically so your 12 digit g10 is what gets embedded into that upc barcode if you're using um, the 12 digit so you should see 12 numbers underneath your barcode if you have an EAN and you are um, a, or a 13 digit G10 and you're encoding that into an EAN barcode, you should see only 13 digits. That last digit is a check digit. So it is part of the 
algorithm of your 12 digit. So the, the G10 is created um, with your prefix, a sequence number based on your capacity, and the last digit is a, uh, a check digit. Now, uh, Walmart, you know, Walmart is is newer to the game as far as, um, you know, the third party marketplace goes. And but they're really, you know, trying to bridge the gap, you know, FBA and, and their WFS. And, and they actually require they don't even have as far as I know, um, I'm, I'm new to it myself. Um, you know, with Amazon, you actually usually want to put the Amazon FN SKU, which is something completely different and just native to to Amazon. And even if you have a UPC on your box, you have to actually cover that up with the Amazon bar- barcode sticker. But I just started sending in shipments now to Walmart WFS, and it actually just requires the the UPC. Um, are you aware, is Walmart at all checking um, w- w- with your guys' database like Amazon is, or, or not yet as far as you know? Uh, they are working with us on that data. So um, mm. it is something they are incorporated into their their systems, but uh, they do require the UPC barcode or EAN barcode, um, but they don't ask you to re-sticker with a Walmart proprietary barcode. So they are using the the GS1 standard. Yeah, barcode. yeah, yep. yeah, and, and that, that's what I that's what I found I had to um, do as well. And, and guys, you know, if you are Helium 10 users and, and you're listening to this, you know, we have the the tool in, in portals which is called barcode barcode labels. And regardless of which uh, of these ones that we're talking about, we, we have a tool that you can actually create those uh, with graphics and things like that so that you don't have to use the standard uh, Amazon ones. Now, a lot of sellers, you know, on, on Amazon, sometimes maybe they run out of stock or or they're, they're still in stock and then they get, you know, a hijacker uh, on, on their listing. Um, I, I've got a, a GS1 barcode. Like, does this give me any protection at all or, or what is something I can do? Unfortunately, there are those bad actors in the market that do uh, try to take advantage of listings and then they'll hijack. Um, you know, I, I hate to say like there's not like you can't control them from doing that, but there are um, at least you have the uh, the tools to help, you know, reclaim your, your listing. Having that GS1 company prefix is uh, really the key. So you can work with um, uh, Amazon selling partner support and provide your GS1 company prefix and say a certificate and say, this is, I am the owner of this uh, G10 or this range of um, G10s. And they generally will uh, help relieve that that G10 hijacking scenario. One other question I had uh, is kind of not uh, in the right timeline here, but I forgot about it. But uh, so one question I've been asked before is, uh, the requirements of registering with GS1. You know, the the cool thing about Amazon is, you know, I could be selling from my garage and, and you know, uh, don't not even have, have a company and, and sell. I, I could be living in the Maldives uh, or I could be a, a citizen in, of, of Pakistan and, and sell on Amazon USA. What do you guys actually require for people to register at least with, with GS1? Um, so for GS1 US, and again, I'll talk mm-hmm. about the U.S. market um, because other MOs may have member organizations may have different um, requirements. Um, really, it's like an e-commerce um, type of transaction. When you go onto our website, we try to make it as easy as possible. Um, and most people are used to e- e-commerce tra- transactions. First, you identify if you want to get a prefix or that single G10. So that's the first decision you have to make. And we have some tools that help you if you don't know. Um, there's a, a, an estimator. So you have to think about how many products you have and how many product variations. So that's just a decision point. But once you decide and put it in your basket, um, it's really just collecting your company information. And if you don't have a company, it's really like I could just say Michelle Covey um, and my address. So it's your business address. And if you are operating out of your home, you can put your home address. Uh, we don't really do any checks against, you know, business data or anything like that. We just ask for a valid contact information, um, billing information, you know, traditional stuff that um, that we could, you know, contact you if we need to. Um, and then the next screen is usually a um, like payment information. So collect your credit card information. You have to click on our terms of agreement. And then um, we once you hit submit, we really uh, it's in near real time will issue you your identifiers. So you'll get them pretty much on the screen, or if you get multiple, then you'll get them in an email right away. And then you will also get, at least with GS1 US, you'll also get access to our data hub tool, which is a a free tool for um, users. And that helps you when you're talking earlier about, I don't know, do you have to add a check digit and how do you construct 
you tend, the tool actually, especially for those smaller businesses that like, this is really brand new to them. And like, how do I do that? Uh, we do that for you within the tool. So you don't have to know what the check digit is. We don't know how to like do that algorithm. Uh, the data hub tool really helps you set that up. And then you could as assign a few product attributes to it. So you can um, identify your products in there. Now, now you guys have deal with uh, tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of Amazon sellers. And, and I'm sure you've gotten some really off the wall, like weird things that happen, but, but what are some of the common, maybe kind of ask questions or, 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 or kind of like obstacles that, that Amazon sellers run up into and that they ask you guys for, for help on things that you think maybe a lot of our listeners might have these same questions. Sure. So there's uh, three common ones that we see. Um, there's a lot of them. Like you said, there's always in those, those strange use cases, but the three yeah. common ones we see um, are the first one is again, going back to, I made the comment on um, like that very first field when you do product identifier and then which one do you select? I think the value, I think the error is value specified is invalid. So if you put in your product identifier and maybe it's a 12 digit, but you collect, select a GTIN, it's actually expecting the UPC not the G10. So you have to make sure that you know for the number that the, the identifier that you add, that you select the right option that goes with it. So is it an mm -hmm. EAN, a G10, or, or a UPC? So that's one of the first ones. Another common error is uh, details don't, do not match. So as you mm -hmm. start to enter your information, um, sometimes this will be associated to your brand name. So if your brand name is uh, does not match in the 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 Amazon database, maybe specifically brand registry, you may get that. So you're going to have to make sure you're brand registered, or if you're using a brand that you're not authorized to sell, you may get that error. And then the third one is um, product already exists. So this one might be you're listing your product. You may actually be the authentic uh, owner of the G10, but um, it, this could be a G10 hijacking case. So there might be somebody already using that G10 on the, um, on the platform. And so you might have to then provide your GS1 company certificate. Um, you may have to prove that you're the rightful owner, work with SPS on that, the selling partner services. Um, but we also run into that one too with that G10 hijacking issue. And then we okay. also have seen other things where as you're listing, you have to make sure you, you know, you're using the right format. You know, are you not using special characters? Uh, don't, you know, put all caps, you know, there's other little tips that you could do when starting your listing process. All right. Uh, one, one question somebody had uh, from one of our Facebook groups is, is let's say that we were on one of those annual plans and for whatever reason, I stop paying my annual subscription. Well, what happens now? Um, do I lose ownership of, of that prefix and that certificate? So um, you would, if if you are an, uh, an annual subscriber, yeah. you do not pay your renewal fee. We record you as an inactive within the GS1 database. So that Gapier, Gapier database, it'll show you're still associated to the prefix, but it'll be inactive. Um, and we report that out. So some companies will use that information. Some others won't. It just depends on what the, you know, how companies use that information. And I can't, I can't say, you know, how Amazon yeah. or Walmart or any other company uses that, but they do get that um, active versus inactive status. So we, we do something on this show called the, uh, that's, or the TST 30 second tip. So, you know, based on, on, on barcodes here or whatever your ex, uh, other expertise you might have, what, what is a, a tip that you can give uh, our listeners out there? So I always say, if you are starting out on Amazon, maybe have one or two products or are testing a few products, you may look at a single G10 or you're just kind of starting out and get a smaller capacity. But we always say, um, think for growth. Think of where you may want to go in, in three to five years or you see if your um, business is growing. So you pre-plan, maybe you want a larger capacity from a prefix standpoint. Um, the other thing to think about is, is if you're also expanding channels, right now we know Amazon really is only um, using the GS1 uh, identifiers like G10, e, you know, the EA and UPC. But other retail channels will actually start to ask you to provide other GS1 barcodes if you're shipping in logistical units. Uh, so carton labels, um, so the GS1-128. So as you start to grow and expand your channels, 
um, you might need to start understanding some of the other GS1 standards um, supported. And we have a, a whole host of resources um, at GS1 uh, that can help sellers with that. Um, you know, basics on how to identify your product, but then how are, how you could use your prefix for that carton labeling for uh, EDI, so trading documents um, electronically between trading partners. So we're not just known for the barcode. We have a lot mm -hmm. of other standards that support supply chain processes that many other retail channel um, retail partners use, and we just want to make sure that we you know let people know that we we're here to help support on that as well in a growth strategy for companies. Awesome. All right. So if one of our listeners out there is ready to go get their their first barcode and, and how can they find you guys on the interwebs or maybe they just want to reach out to, uh, you know, uh, get some more information uh, on this subject, how, uh, how can they do that? Sure. Um, our, our website, it's fairly straightforward, is gs1us.org. GS1US.org. All right. Well, I'm also just going to put in a plug too. We do also have a YouTube channel, which has a lot of very short um, videos, like a GS1US YouTube channel has a lot of great resources, um, short videos that explain what a GTIN is, explain some of the supply chain um, processes that I just mentioned. Um, so that's another whole host. And we also have a great um, education library, education um, and training resource library. Awesome. Awesome. Well, well, thank you for coming on here. You know, this is a, sometimes there, there are subjects that don't really have to do with every single uh, Amazon seller, like, you know, three, who's going to use 3d imaging or something like that. Well, it's important to, to some, but not to others, but this is something that literally affects every single Amazon seller because it's something that Amazon requires and you guys need to be in compliance on. So I hope everybody was paying attention. Thank you so much for joining us, uh, Michelle. And maybe if some, some new happen happenings uh, come about in this industry we'll be reaching out to you for some some updates